It gives me indeed great pleasure to introduce Archbishop Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the leader of the World Anglican Communion. As he speaks to us this afternoon here at the World Council of Churches in the Ecumenical Centre, the Fisertoft Hall. I welcome this great audience present in the room and I welcome all of you who follow us online all over the world in the whole Anglican Communion and beyond. It is a great pleasure and also a great opportunity for all of us to look at how this tapestry's motto, Hina Pantes Hen Hosin, that they all may be one, is our guiding principle also as we now this year have our 70th anniversary under the motto, Walking Together, Serving Justice and Peace. This is one of the many events this year that marks this history, but also that give us guidance to where do we walk together from here. This is not the end, by no means. This is one important milestone on our way forward. And in this perspective, we particularly welcome you, Archbishop Justin, that you give us this opportunity to hear you, to also to discuss with you, and to commit ourselves to our common journey. I well remember your participation in the 10th Assembly in the World Council of Churches in Busan, in South Korea, October 2013. We received with great pleasure, but also with great inspiration, the way you greeted us and the way you told us how much that was also an entry for you into the cooperation with the World Council of Churches as you saw it as an expression of a living family, a living reality, and fellowship. And now, this God-given ministry of reconciliation, which you have taken on yourself in so many ways, is what we share, and also what we today, and also in other days, share as very concrete and very challenging tasks led before us as we move forward. As Christians, as human beings as one humanity. And of course, as we mark this 70th anniversary, we are mindful of how much the Anglican Communion and also the Archbishop of Canterbury, yourself and your predecessors, have contributed to this fellowship. And how much the whole idea of working together for the visible unity of the Church so that the world may believe, but also so that the world may believe that there is a future for us together, under God's grace, and also in peace with one another. We remember also well that your predecessor, Ron Williams, was here and addressed us in this hall. This is a very good tradition, and let it not be the last time. We have received the title for your speak to us, Ecumenical Spring, From Negotiated Frontiers to Open Borders. I like that you take an uh, image from the seasons of the year. When I came into this office, I was reminded that we lived in an ecumenical winter. And as a Norwegian, I was joking with them and say, well, what is wrong with winter? <laughs> that is uh, half of the year, and we Norwegians, we know how to love it and how to enjoy it. The other side of it is that if there is no winter and no season, there is no time to mature, to reflect and to prepare for the spring and the summer. But I'm happy that you open this perspective for us from the perspective of spring. I think we live in a momentum in our time and these days where there is really an ecumenical spring, a new opportunity to seek the unity that Christ prayed for and also to find new expressions for it. Your being here is definitely one of them and thank you and the floor is yours.
Thank you to the General Secretary. Thank you to all of you for coming on a Friday afternoon when you could be going home and having a nice, quiet Friday evening in winter. <laughs> Trouble, I worked when I was in the oil industry. I spent a lot of time working in Norway. Are you sure winter is only half the year? <laughs> it can be more. <laughs> I'm glad you remember the visit of Rowan Williams, an extraordinary man, uh, one of our greatest archbishops. Remember uh, what he did and what he said for, I think, in a few years, people will look back and say what a remarkable archbishop he was. He is much underestimated. I am very glad to be here during the 70th anniversary year of the World Council of Churches. My predecessor, Geoffrey Fisher, chaired the session at the first assembly in Amsterdam in 1948, in which the World Council was brought into being. The churches of the Anglican Communion have been involved in the work of the WCC and other parts of the ecumenical movement at all levels since the very beginning, and indeed before the very beginning, with the great call to the churches of the Lambeth Conference in 1920, and also the work of Archbishop William Temple in the period up to and including his time as Archbishop of Canterbury. And I would like to say that the more I see of the World Council of Churches, having had little contact with it before I took on this position some five years ago, the more I see its necessity. It is a privilege to be with you. And I continue to pray for God's blessing on your work, a blessing without which nothing can prosper. There was a clear tension, well known to historians of the church in the 20th century, between those whose appetite was for theological discussion and those who preferred to leave all that to one side and get on with serving God's people together. Put crudely, this was the divide between faith and order and life and work, two movements brought together by the WCC. Theological dialogue has brought great fruit. During the 20th century, we witnessed major theological and doctrinal rapprochement between the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox on Christology and between the Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation on Justification. Remember, these were the issues on which major schisms in the Church were based. From the perspective of the Anglican Communion, Interchurch bilateral dialogue led to unity schemes between Anglicans and hitherto non-Episcopal churches in South Asia, and relationships of communion between Anglicans and Lutherans in North America and Northern Europe, and between Anglicans and Methodists in Ireland. And yet it continues, which is why I speak of Ecumenical Spring. Just last Friday, in a debate at the General Synod of the Church of England, there was a vote with a 75% majority, three to one, in the Synod for moving ahead with negotiations, discussions, dialogue, towards the mutual recognition of ministry with the British Methodists. That is an extraordinary thing. This would involve the Methodists accepting episcopacy in a personalized form as opposed to the episcopate, the episcopate resting in the Methodist Conference. It would involve the Church of England allowing the ministry of Methodist presbyters in Church of England churches who had not been ordained episcopally. At least for a while that would happen, a period called the so-called bearable anomaly. <laughs> Very Anglican. The agreement arises out of the covenant signed between the two churches more than 10 years ago and out of extensive and detailed theological dialogue. It is a small step 
but it is a step along a journey and it is of considerable significance and instructively has the support of all our other ecumenical partners. Let no one say that theological di dialogue is vain or mere academia. It is far more than that. However, it is more than 25 years since there was first talk of ecumenical winter. In a lecture in this building nearly 25 years ago, Conrad Reiser, then General Secretary of the WCC, mentioned ecumenical winter, commenting that it should be that noted that winter is followed by spring, except in Norway. <laughs> when winter is followed by winter. <laughs> or in London, where winter is followed by rain. <laughs> Indeed, it was after that lecture in 1993 that most of the agreements I outlined earlier took place. Cardinal Walter Casper wrote a book entitled Harvesting the Fruits, in which he made this point. There may have been an ecumenical winter, but it was a winter in which much fruit was harvested, not least the agreements I've mentioned. Many, if not all, divisions in the church were over matters of principle, be it doctrine, questions of power and authority, or territorial disputes. In doctrinal and principle disputes, the barriers come up and the territory is demarcated, is set out. You believe this, I believe that. You do this, I do that. You are wrong, I am right we set up our barriers. Bilateral and multilateral theological dialogue over the course of the 20th century bore much fruit, but at times it could be rather like the diplomatic renegotiation of frontiers. The barriers to communion still exist. They've just been moved a bit. The negotiation of the ways in which frontiers are set down by states and which they are crossed is one of the most difficult aspects of international relations at times of tension. We have moved the frontiers. For instance, there was a watershed agreement on the doctrine of justification between the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church. This was the defining doctoral disagreement of the European Reformation. But it didn't bring the two churches into communion. It simply moved the frontier to a different point. It is, of course, real, tangible, ecumenical progress for that agreement to have been made. And I'm very pleased that the Anglican Consultative Council in 2016 has affirmed the substance of the agreement, as, as much as Anglicans ever join together in anything, has become part of that agreement. Such agreements make progress on other issues more possible, but they are not the whole story. Frontiers imply difference. They say to us that on the other side of the frontier is the other, the other person, the other culture, the other race, nation, type, sort of people. Ecumenism that looks as though it is about the negotiation of frontiers is an ecumenism that is based on theological foundations of sand. Indeed, one might argue that it is not based on foundations at all. All ecclesiology begins with Christology. The problem with our divisions, to put, in, to put it in simplest terms, is that they say to the world that Christ is divided. By ourselves being divided, we, draw, we call attention of the outsider, of those who look away from the extraordinarily beautiful person of Jesus Christ, who draws to himself and to his love every human being who has been born, who lives and whoever will be born, and instead, by our divisions, we say, look at us. We don't say, look at Christ. We say, look at us. Like the evil fairy in so many folk stories that comes to the birth or christening of a princess, division waves its wand 
and the world turns to look at the church itself and does not much like what it sees. The role of the church is not to point to itself, but to point to Christ. When that happens, the world finds that it is indeed convicted of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. Negotiated frontiers start with barriers. They reveal others and otherness. They diminish our capacity to pray. They reduce our assurance of the gift of salvation. And they deeply impede our mission. If you will excuse a bit of British irony, apart from those three problems, denominations and divisions are entirely advantageous. Open borders, by contrast, allow the other to be part of ourselves. They permit movement and transfer, exhibiting not division but diversity. In their openness, they invite encounter as opposed to frontiers which require resilience and courage to cross. The ecclesiology of an open border is to say that we are one with differences, rather that we are many seeking what it is to be one. Theologically, Christologically, ecclesiologically, to see ourselves as one with fractures is vastly more authentic to the work and purpose of God in Christ through creation, through salvation history, through the work of the Spirit today, and towards the revealing of the kingdom of God, than it is to see ourselves as different, as other. Yet the practical application of open borders is immensely difficult because we are used to clearly demarcated frontiers. For 500 years, we've got used to the frontiers. They have become part of the landscape, with some parts of the church for almost a thousand years. They are normal. They're like the mountains out there. It does not occur to us that they could move, that they could cease to be. As I have said before, the way we live is like a family where the relationships have broken down. They may live in the same house, but they live in separate rooms, they have separate lives, and they do not talk to each other politely too easily. We become used to it. We, become, we begin to think, this is normal. It is not normal. It is deceiving. We are deceived, and we deceive the world into the purpose and power of Christ. But frontiers give us security and a sense of definition and identity, even if it is only negative. We are not like them. The effort of recognizing that the Spirit of God is at work equally among others is hard to assimilate. Within churches, our legal structures preclude the support of other churches across the frontier. If an English bishop in the Church of England sees that there is a church of another denomination doing wonderful work, it is immensely complicated to bless that work by supporting that church, licensing its pastor, and enabling it to work with us and us with them. The paperwork is that thick and ends with the words, no. <laughs> we tie ourselves down through our inability to imagine who we really are that we are the people of God. For the proper theologian, and I do not consider myself as such, there will be a tendency to say, tell me something I don't know. They are right. However, being right is not the same as being agonized by our divisions. 
the point of the church, the objective of the church is worship and mission. Justice and peace in all creation, with creation, through creation. Peace with God, peace with one another. Justice for the poor and the suffering. Everything else apart from worship and mission is decoration. It may be very nice decoration, good decoration, not decoration you wish to lose, but it is not the essential. Something that impedes our mission and hinders our worship is therefore something that destroys the object of the church's existence. For this reason alone, we must deal not only at the theological, Christological and ecclesiological levels, but at the psychological levels, at our habits of division, our ways of looking at one another, our instinctive approach. It is at the psychological level that we struggle almost beyond endurance. For even if we admit that theologically, Christologically, ecclesiologically, we are one with differences, psychologically and missiologically, we do not look like it. For this reason, and even if there were no other reason, for this reason alone, the work of ecumenism is not merely an urgent question for the churches. It is an existential one. One of the great gifts of the ecumenical movement is that it has allowed Christians from different denominations who might once have kept separate from each other to get to know one another. There were times, say, before the 1960s, when people of one church might never have entered the church building of another. Indeed, many may have feared to go in for fear either of being thrown out or worse, contaminated by the place itself. Then something changed. Christians found common cause in all sorts of forums, political life, spirituality and prayer, community service, education, children's work. Important examples of this cross-denominational work are the civil rights movement in the United States of America and the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. New religious communities sprang up with an ecumenical charism, such as Deze and Focolari. This shifting tension between closed frontiers and open borders is not new in the life of the church across the world. One of the many less than welcome gifts that the church in Europe bequeathed to the rest of the world through emigration and missionary expansion was Christian division. It did not take that long for Christian missionaries to realize that competing for the same souls for Christ was not entirely productive. There was productive cooperation, but there was also the dividing of territory and the setting up of frontiers. When you travel around sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, as I do fairly frequently, you come across areas, sometimes almost whole countries, that are predominantly of one Christian church or another, and then you move across an invisible frontier to a stronghold of another church. It was the missionary movement, though, through early evangelistic crusades and then the World Missionary Conference in Edinburgh in 1910, where the early principles of open borders were born. They were at the same time the problem and the beginnings of the solution. However, a great deal of such ecumenical action remains hidden from the official ecumenical organs. Research in England around the turn of the millennium showed that there was a great deal of ecumenical activity that went under the radar of the ecumenical movement. Christians simply got on with expressing their ministry of prayer, evangelism and service, together with friends from other churches. In England today, and I'm sure it is true in part, other parts of the world, many congregations are made up of people who started their Christian life in other churches. The result of this is that traditions, ideas and worship styles from one church are brought into another. The wind of the spirit, which has brought such movements into reality, is blowing ever more powerfully. 
In many places, it is becoming a hurricane. Let me give you an example. Three years ago, looking at the condition of the Church of England, the Archbishop of York and I made a joint call to parishes in England to join together in the period between Ascension and Pentecost to pray for the mission of the Church and especially for the proclamation of the Gospel, focusing on those who each Christian knew and loved but who did not have the assurance and peace and understanding of grace that comes as a gift from being a disciple of Jesus Christ. We called this appeal, Thy Kingdom Come. In the first year, we were optimistic by English standards, and we thought that perhaps four or 5,000 people might join in. There were 100,000, including large numbers from churches other than the Church of England. A very large number of cathedrals took part and were filled by people during that period coming to pray, as much to their surprise as to ours. In the second year, last year, churches in 85 countries participated, including many provinces of the Anglican Communion. This year it seems likely to be a far greater number, including churches from every denomination that we encounter. The blessing of this movement of prayer for mission and evangelism is, not, is that it is not centrally directed, but moved by the Spirit. We do not set out forms of prayer. We give resources on the web, and we simply say, pray in whatever way is right for you, suitable for you. More than that, even better, it has grown from being a Church of England thing to being something that is not in any way recognisably Anglican. And probably most people who are involved in the prayer, whether as individuals or through their churches or more widely, will have no idea that it originated in the Church of England. I praise God for that ignorance. May it deepen. We do not want this to be Anglican. We want the church to pray as a prayer of Christians for those who do not know the love of Christ and who are not reached by the church's obedience to the mission of God. Another example with which I am familiar, there will be hundreds with which I am unfamiliar, my apologies for that, is what we call the Reconciling Leaders Network. Again, this is something that springs from a gospel imperative to be involved in peacemaking it is part of your slogan for this time. Your own General Secretary, forgive me for embarrassing you, is one of the great embodiments, incarnations of this passion, as is his own country of Norway. Yet we find that as we work on this, more and more people are caught up by the desire to be part of reconciliation. One particular aspect, which we call women on the front line, with which my wife is closely involved, will seek to mobilize the voices and the activities of women through training and formation in some of the most difficult and violent parts of the world, where women remain objects of sexual violence and conflict and the suffering subjects of the deepest oppression. On top of that, they mourn and bury their dead and have to live with the consequences of being refugees. This RLN, Reconciling Leaders Network, seems to be getting well beyond our control, well outside our leadership. Praise God for that. We can only make it less good. The Spirit will carry it into the hearts of people if that is right. Pope Francis, in the meeting and declaration which I had with him, which followed the 50th anniversary of the meeting of Pope Paul VI and Archbishop Michael Ramsey, spoke in our joint declaration of an ecumenism of action. By action, we did not mean that Protestant vice of running around constantly trying to do things, while occasionally remembering to ask God to bless them, it means rather than ecumenism, which is seen in the visible solidarity of Christians in the cause of mission, 
of the living out of the gospel amongst the poor and the struggling and evangelism. Thus, in England, we see the ecumenism of action through prayer like Thy Kingdom Come, through food banks, through night shelters, through debt counselling and support for marriage, through the Near Neighbours programme, which brings together different faiths so that by love we can tackle extremism. We see the ecumenism of action in the Great Lakes Peace Initiative in Africa and the ecumenism of action in serving the poor in the townships around Johannesburg. The ecumenism of action is deeply based in the truth of the oneness of Christ. It is, if you will forgive a family story from my own family, the ecumenism that was shown between two of our children when the boyfriend of one of our daughters was rude about the daughter's elder brother. The daughter and her elder brother at that time never stopped arguing. This was some years ago. But this attack on her brother, verbally, in a quiet conversation, produced an ecumenical movement, which led to the boyfriend being ditched almost instantly. The ecumenism of action says that faced with evil, we come together in love and show that we are one. As the preacher to the papal household, Father de Cantalamessa, said in a sermon, would you believe, for the opening of the General Synod of the Church of England in 2015, in front of the Queen in Westminster Abbey. Now, can you imagine that 70 years ago? That shows how we've changed. What he said was this, in a memorable phrase, it's a beautiful sermon, I think it's on my website. When they kill us, talking of Daesh, when they kill us, they do not ask whether we are Catholics, Orthodox, Pentecostal or Anglican. They ask if we are Christians. It would be easy from this account that I've given to fall into the error of thinking that all ecumenism that is effective is from the life and work stream. Yet, as I hope I've already shown in speaking of our relationship with English Methodists, ecumenism must also be rooted in theological dialogue, or it becomes merely utilitarian. One of the most important of recent ecumenical developments has been the concept of receptive ecumenism. This concept, based predominantly on the work of Professor Paul Murray at Durham, takes as its premise that no single church or denomination within the divided body of Christ can be wholly without need of the gift of the ch other churches and denominations. Much of the ecumenism of negotiated frontiers is based on drawing up a list of red lines, a phrase that we hear the whole time in the Brexit negotiations, and that is the only time I will mention Brexit in this lecture. <laughs> red lines over which you must not cross. Receptive ecumenism looks beyond those frontiers and asks what it is that we can receive from another church or tradition. It turns negotiated frontiers into open borders. As pointed out above, the experience of the church in England at least, is that people are less constrained by denominational boundaries than in the past. Boundaries between the churches are more fluid. When a Christian family or individual moves to a new area, particularly in towns and cities, the church to which they go is normally a choice. It is as likely to be based on style, music, children's work, accessibility, where their friends go, or where they fit in socially as it is to be based on the denomination of the church. As a bishop conducting confirmations, I regularly confirm those who have been adult members of non-Episcopal churches and receive into the communion of the Church of England adults who have been confirmed in the Catholic or Orthodox Church. My friend and colleague, the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, does exactly the same thing the other way round. As we receive people, we receive their traditions, their stories, and their spirituality, 
and this affects and improves our own. So looking forward, what I pray for is an ecumenism of action theologically underpinned. One of my favourite quotations, which I th think I use far too often, comes from the writings of Edward Gibbon, the great historian of the late 18th century, whose monumental books, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, in six volumes, remain the finest piece of English prose and a great work of history. My wife gave me all six volumes when we first married, and I worked my way through them during aeroplane flights over the next 20 years. <laughs> Gibbon says this in his introduction. The religions of the Roman Empire were to the people all equally true, to the philosophers all equally false, and to the magistrates all equally useful. There is a great danger that the ecumenism of action turns into the ecumenism of being useful. We can easily fall into the trap of believing that if we cannot agree, then we can at least do something together that is nice and useful. But this is massively to understate and to misrepresent the nature of the ecumenism of action. The ecumenism of action springs out of prayer, and I would argue especially out of the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, we find the body of Christ broken and the blood of Christ shared and poured out. And as the church is empowered and renewed by its reception, so our memory and understanding of the frailty and risk of the incarnation is restored to the center of our minds and to the impulsion of our hearts and spirits. In the incarnation, Jesus bears all the sin and fragility of the world. And in the host, we see that fragility renewed constantly in fresh life and power. The ecumenism of action springs from that cycle of death and resurrection, of frailty and renewal, and its creation within us again and again and again of the compassion of God for a world of frailty, sin and darkness, in which without the witness of Christ, there is no light of resurrection, no dawn of a coming kingdom. The world is crying out in need. As we know more and more of each other, and experience more and more of each other ever more rapidly through social media and international communication, our capacity to love one another is increasingly overburdened and inadequate. Yesterday afternoon, I met with the President of Turkey. Some Years ago, 30 years ago, I would have made my way, perhaps through Geneva if I was lucky, back to London, and we would have issued a press release, and the Times would have published it, and most other papers would have ignored it. And some three or four months later, someone would have read about it and thought, oh, that's interesting. By yesterday evening, my chief of staff tells me, that I was being severely trolled on Twitter, mainly by Russian-based bots. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, look it up. <laughs> I don't either, actually, but they're... <laughs> I'm repeating what he told me. They're automatic Twitter feeds. I thought those were called children. Our capacity to deal with difference is overburdened because we know so much. It's not that we know less. We know far, far more. And we know it now. Not in a few seconds' time or a few weeks. There is no time to stop and reflect. And we do not deal well with each other. In the United Kingdom at the moment, one of the great arguments is over international aid. In the early years of this decade, the United Kingdom reached the United Nations target of 0.7% of GDP in international development funding. Much of the press 
opposes that vigorously and uses the otherness of the other to demonstrate the vanity of spending money in such ways. In the past, that would have been difficult for lack of information. Today, they can get it off social media and use it day after day after day after day with new stories and new headlines. Because we know more, we seem to love less. The ecumenism of action is threatened by our knowledge, not by our ignorance. The world is crying out in need, not only in the obvious ways in which our newspapers tell us, but in the spiritual need of incapacity to forgive each other's sins, incapacity to be reconciled to one another, to live as one beautifully diverse, utterly extraordinary creation, and living as one to represent the oneness of God in Christ. The ecumenism of action theologically underpinned should be our response to such, our, to such darkness. We must say together that we will carry the light of Christ together into the darkness. We must not allow ourselves to believe that great and ancient lie that darkness can sometimes overcome light, held as untruth ever since the prologue of St. John was first written in the dark paganism of the first century. It is not simply that we do things better together. It is that we are the church when we are together. We are obedient when we are together. We are open to the Spirit of God blowing in power through us into a world becalmed in suffering when we are together. We can become too pragmatic about this, forgetting its theological foundations. At the Declaration of American Independence in July 1776, one of its great leaders, Benjamin Franklin, said to the colonists about to fight the might of the British Empire and win, we must surely hang together, he said to his friends, or we will most certainly hang separately. That is, or may be, true for the church in many places. But it is not the reason for our ecumenism of action theologically founded. And if we allow ourselves to be useful and self-protected as the motivation for ecumenism, we have to use a profound phrase that is often said to me, lost the plot. The ecumenism of action theologically founded is also based in this reality that need does not wait for theological argument but for the compassion of Christ. St. John Paul II said in Ut Unum Sint that, I quote, it's quite a long quote, how indeed can we proclaim the gospel of reconciliation without at the same time being committed to work for reconciliation between Christians? However true it is, he went on, that the church, by the promising of the Holy Spirit and with the promise of indefectibility, has preached and still preaches the gospel to all nations. It is also true that she must face the difficulties which derive from the lack of unity. When non-believers meet missionaries who do not agree among themselves, even though they all appeal to Christ, will they be in a position to receive the true message? Will they not think that the gospel is a cause of division, despite the fact that it is presented as the fundamental law of love? He went on, the unity brought about by action together in the service of Christ makes the other less a stranger and more a Christian brother and sister. At this point, by the grace of God, the theological and ecclesiological dialogue become easier. The two are not exclusive of one another. End of quote. It is not the case that an ecumenism of action leaves theology outside the room. The action that the churches and Christians take together is an outworking of the spiritual unity that exists between all who proclaim that Jesus is Lord. The Lunt Declaration, another great touchstone of the story of the ecumenical movement, declares that churches should do all things together, save those things which in conscience they must do apart.
One of the finest characteristics of the WCC was from very early on to hold together the theological, diaconal and evangelistic ecumenical movements. They are one and the same, working, to use a military metaphor, in a pincer movement against division and enmity. Theological dialogue and discussion brings people closer together and sets up the framework for joint action. Joint action brings people closer together and sets up the relationship that enables theological dialogue and discussion. To conclude, in the early days of his pontificate, which started two days before I took up this present office, as the Pope reminded me on our first meeting, two days before, he said, Pope Francis made several public statements in which he used the metaphor of sheep, the shepherd and the sheepfold. I had cause to look at these statements again last year when I was invited to write a reflection on them for a collection of reflections on the words of Pope Francis. The most famous of these statements was when he exhorted the clergy, the pastors, to have the smell of the sheep, so close were they to their people, the flock. But in other statements, he spoke of the sheepfold being like the church. His interesting take on this is that as well as the traditional understanding of the absolute need to go out and seek the lost, to bring them back into the safety of the sheepfold, he saw that it was possible for the sheepfold to be used as a frontier, as a barrier. Not only keeping out the wolves, but also the other sheep. The state of the church today is such that in many places, particularly in Europe and England, Europe is England, <laughs> for another 14 months. <clears throat> I said I wouldn't say Brexit again, didn't I? I apologize. <laughs> the state of the church today is such that in many places, we can see not one outside the fold and 99 within, but 99 outside and one within. It's almost true in England. 1.7% of the population attend a Church of England. And in doing that, the task is great. It is appropriate, right, and imperative that the churches work together to seek out the lost wherever they may be. To find that when we bring them into the safety of the fold, it should be one fold, not many and that the flock is one flock with one shepherd, the good shepherd himself, who prays that we may be one. Thank you. Thank you, Archbishop Justin, for this uh, rich exposure of your reflections about both the World Council of Churches and the many churches, including your own. We have some minutes now for questions or comments from the floor, if you want to. There are two colleagues who have uh, microphones who will be guided to you if you give a signal. Over here, yeah. There's a microphone here. Oh. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was Could fascinating. Could you also please uh, introduce yourself? The question is, I remember attending the first ecumenical camp in Bosse in 52. And I remember meeting Mr. Wissertuft in the first seat of the World Council that was in Malagnu, lovely place. <laughs> And my question is that when we had the first, Our Father which art in heaven, the prayer together at Bursaid 52, the first time Protestant and Catholic praying together, we were all in tears. And the second souvenir, the first meeting between the German Communist part of Germany and the other part, and I had a full suitcase 
of booklet on Geneva and on the reformators and all 30 delegates from the DDR, they got their copy. Now my question is, did you experience once such a camp with the intensity of um, the Holy Spirit working in Oikumene? Thank you for your question. Um, not a camp, but a journey. Uh, when we were first married in 1979, in, 90, in the summer of 1980 and 1981, I was working in Paris. My wife and I took Bibles and other Christian literature in large numbers, uh, concealed in a secret compartment in a camping van, first to Czechoslovakia in 1980 and to Romania in 1981. And there we went to every kind of church. Uh, we went to Catholic and Orthodox and Lutheran and Pentecostal and Baptist, you name it. And there we experienced that intensity of the work of the Spirit and came back not thinking we'd met Catholic and Orthodox or whatever, but simply that we'd met Christians. Anybody else? Um. Yes, please. Could you also uh, introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm the chief executive of a think tank called the, the Geneva Center on Human Rights Advancement and Global Dialogue. I'm uh, Algerian and a Muslim. And I have always regretted that the word ecumenical covered all the churches and that what you said is wonderful but I wonder whether we can't invent a word that would cover all the Christian churches and the Muslims and others to work hand in hand because I think uh, that Islam is not a new religion. It claims to be a prolongation of the, of, uh, the, Ju uh, the Judaism and Christianity. So I look forward to a time perhaps that where all the remarks that you have made could apply to a broader religious uh, community encompassing also uh, the Islamic faith. Your Excellency, um, I know you were ambassador here for a very long time. Um, I think I mean, it's, it's Hans Kung who said no peace in the world without peace between the religions. Um, often the word ecumenism is used to include different faiths. I think um, the experience we're increasingly finding in the dialogue we're having on interfaith, with, uh, interfaith dialogue is that as we recognize difference we can, al we can also affirm our love for one another. And I believe that that is where that begins. It's a very different kind of theological dialogue. Um, uh, one of my close friends, David Ford, Professor David Ford at Cambridge, has, with others, been developing uh, a process of what, he calls, of what is called scriptural reasoning where they will gather for, people will gather for three or four days for a meeting of different faiths, at the moment mainly the Abrahamic faiths, and they will, though there is some from the Dharmic faith, and they will uh, read each other's scriptures, not to teach from that scripture to someone else, but in the group to share what they find in the scriptures, in each other's scriptures. Now, a few years ago, I did a mini version of this in Lent um, when I invited uh, an imam who is a good friend of mine to come and we met each week, or we met three times during Lent, and we, I read, uh, we, we read some passages from John's Gospel and some passages from the Quran. And we shared our understanding of them and helped each other hear through them. We did not compromise on the integrity of our own faith, but we did learn to love one another, another more deeply. It's a start. We can take one more. Yes. Yes. 
please introduce yourself. Okay, uh, since I'm already standing. Uh, my name is Fulata Moyo. Uh, I work with World Council of Churches responsible for the program on uh, just community of women and men. And uh, I thank you for the reflections. I have a small question. Um, you've talked about um, the the way um, when the ch when when actually the church has an encounter with Christ, then the, there is a kind of transformation that really brings love love to the fore in the way you deal with each other. And I'm asking uh, my question as a woman and a black woman working in. Uh, the ecumenical movement and uh, realizing that even when you talk about uh, open borders, questions of sexism and racism are still the most difficult questions in the ecumenical movement. So I would really love if you could comment on this especially because um, you've given examples of some of the initiatives that you've carried out and some of them have uh, to do like um, the prayer for mission and evangelism and others. And I know that the uh, um, Church of England has a beautiful history connected also to the World Day of Prayer, which started in the US as a, a prayer, women gathering to pray for, for home and foreign mission. And it has spread. It is now a global movement. And we also know that England is also a birthplace of YWCA, which started with just two women who realized that during the Industrial Revolution, the young women mar and married were coming to London and they had no place to stay and it was not safe for them. How do we embrace these initiatives by women that have already been there when we carry out uh, ecumenical initiatives that are also focusing on similar issues, but also, yeah. I, I hope my question is clear. Your question is very helpful. Thank you very much. I entirely agree with the assumption you make that the um, questions of sexism and racism are some of the most difficult to conquer. Uh, it's well known. It was Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King who I believe said that Sunday morning is the most segregated three hours of the week uh, when people go to church because they only go to their own churches uh, of the, and they they select by race and by uh, not by gender so much but by race uh, two days ago I heard from someone who I was talking to I was in the middle of preparation for some baptism and she'd been talking to a senior clergyman uh, who'd uh, said to her about my chaplain who is a woman and happens to have been born in France. Um, I suppose that French woman has corrupted you. <laughs> and you just wonder, you know, which century are we in? Um, anyway, I, so I, I mean, the evidence is all around us. So let's not argue about the premise, it's obvious. Secondly, we need to hold on to our corporate memory. You mentioned wonderful things. I want to add one to, you, to them because it was my own ignorance that I did not know about it 
and I've discovered about it and have never stopped telling people since, the Anglican Mothers' Union, which is the largest and oldest mothers, uh, women's organization in the world and uh, does wonderful, wonderful things, is completely forgotten by most people, started in the 19th century. Um, what do we do? First of all, we have to remember, and there are traditions in many different churches which are important. Who is the apostle to the apostles? It is a woman. Who uh, finds Peter when he uh, comes to the door after escaping from prison? It is a woman. Uh, who is the first witness to the Samaritans? It is a woman. We could go on and on. When we know our tradition and our faith well, we recognize how foolish and sinful it is to hold on to sexism and racism. Where we differ, of course, is in, not you and I, but where uh, within the church we struggle is how that works out in practice, particularly when it comes to office in the church. Uh, I meet some people strongly in favor of black and minority ethnic rights in the UK who just never appoint anyone from the BME community uh, to their own organizations. Oh, they tell me the whole time that they believe in, they're very anti-racist. It's just they've never f met anyone from another ethnic group who could do the job. That tells you where we, how, far, how deeply it goes, you have to go. And we do have genuine differences within the church, but they must be differences within the family, not differences between families. So even when we meet people who sin in this way, as with a family, we have still to love them, because if we do not love them, they can never find a better way of being. And that is the biggest challenge of all, particularly for their victims, for those that they exclude. How do you love the one that excludes you? Well, I, when I'm attacked and opposed and slandered, I struggle and struggle and struggle. And the only way I find an answer is to come back to the cross and to meditation, adoration before the sacrament and reflection on where, what Jesus did for me. It's probably not a good answer, but it's the best one I've got. Thank you so much. And thank you for your <coughs> very interesting comments and questions here. We have come to the moment when we should close. Before we do that, um, I would like to invite uh, my colleagues, uh, particularly my colleague, the Deputy General Secretary, uh, Professor Isabel Pono Fieri, to give you a symbolic gift uh, to show something of what we actually can do and what we do. Right, I need to give you a little bit of an explanation. On the 25th of October 2016, the World Council of Churches you know, became a blue community. And uh, by becoming a blue community, it means that we, we are recognizing water as a human right and saying no to the sale and use of bottled water in places where tap water is safe to drink. And we are also promoting publicly financed, owned and operated drinking water and wastewater treatment services. And every year we celebrate uh, the Lenten campaign, which is seven weeks of water. And this, we just launched uh, this year's you know, uh, Lenten campaign on Wednesday when we were in Colombia. So uh, since then, we, you, we actually use bottled water. And we encourage all our member, uh, our staff members you know, to be 
you know, using bottled water. And we also, we also give the same to the visitors. So we want to take this opportunity to share with you the, bottle, the water for life for you and your delegation to use. So the first one is yours. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one for the Reverend Dr. William Adam. <laughs> and another one for Mr. David Porter. <laughs> and the last one for Jack Palmer White. You, I hope you'll be using this bottled water from now on. <laughs> we already did. Right. Okay, you. thank you. Ecumenism can be very practical. <laughs> Another practical way of doing things together is that we today, or yesterday, I got a letter from the Vatican whether we could respond to Pope Francis' call to have a joint day of prayer for peace in South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the next Friday, the 23rd of February. And we will do that, and we will send an uh, invitation to all our member churches, including yours. We're already doing it. <laughs> what I thought. But just to say, we are, in, we are together in these ways, in many ways, but also in these ways of prayer. I thank you again. This has been a marvelous moment of listening, but also of sharing, actually a whole day. And we will finish by a reception in the lobby, a moment of, of sharing. But let me share with you one thing at the end, and that is that there is spring in Norway. And maybe, maybe we love it more than anybody else, because <laughs> the winter is so long, and that's also why an ecumenical spring is such a gift. And I think God is giving it to us, and your presence among us today was a sign of that. Thank you. <laughs>